Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. S sorry, I was a little late. You're fine. Uh, how y'all doing? Veronica's here. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kara's here. Cassandra. How about Madison? Madison here tonight. Romero, Alex, are you here? Tin? Tin here. Mac is here. Bell? Bell's here? I'm here, sir. Thank you, Bell. Victoria is here. Um, Grazi? And Brian is here. Okay, I got seven of you here anyway. How you doing? Pretty good? Everybody? Peachy right. King? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, how do we know what is our grade? Because I... Good, I'm, good. One of the things you should make sure you mention on your SSI is the indecipherableness of your grade book. All right? He's got that set up so that if you do not have, if you haven't submitted a sample, if you haven't submitted a, a report, you get an automatic zero on it. Okay, now, guys, I, I'm only gonna show you this if all seven of you agree to let me show you the grade book. Is there any objection? I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to go ahead and put the grades up. All right. What you do is you enter grades in, Veronica. You're going to enter this another way than I do. But what you're going to do is you're going to take your slide all the way over. And I do not know how he did this. I don't know why he did this. But literally speaking, if you go all the way over, and look how long this silly thing is. All right, now I'm getting close. All right. This is the overall points you need to get what you need. So far. So, Veronica. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think this is right even. All right. If you're seeing this letter grade after chemical formula, after sodium hydroxide and so on and so forth, are you seeing that, Veronica? Yes. Okay, we just had the... Uh, I just graded the spectrophotomic determination of a food dye. Did I grade that yet or not? No, that's how we turned it in yesterday. Okay. A lot of so, stuff yet. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go back one then, okay? All right. Right now, up until this point, he's saying you have 875.7 out of 1,000 points. So right now you got an 87.57 percentage. Okay, Veronica? Okay. So that's how you that is how you determine where you're standing in the class. Okay. That's, I don't know how it works. Uh, basically, I've just thrown my hands up. I have I have asked to have a simpler grade book in the past, and my requests have gone unfulfilled. I don't make excuses for it. I just have to try and deal with it as best I can. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, is it because I see when we see the grades, he says that one gets dropped. Is with one of I them? I believe I believe this has the drop grade in it, Veronica. Oh, okay. But I can't be certain. Mm -hmm. The only way I could be certain is to add up, and it's the only way you can be certain is to add up the scores you have and divide the scores you have by the total points. 
Okay. I'm sorry. I really, I really am sorry about this. I don't like it, but it's something I have to deal with. Any questions about that, guys? So yes, if you notice your grades for the next for the food diet, how in the world is that possible? Okay, what may be possible here is you did really good. Did you do good on the post lab and the pretty lab? Yeah. That's probably why this is why your grade went up. So right now you're looking at a 91%. Okay. okay. That explains you got a 10 out of 10 on the TLC pre lab, didn't you? I haven't done that one yet. <laughs> it's telling me you got to tell you the pre lab. The pre lab, Veronica, that's the one you do before. Before. Oh, you, yes, yes, yes. So you got a 10 out of 10 on that, I can tell just by looking at those two scores. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Best I can do, sorry. Anybody else have any other questions? Can we go over the last two questions in the post lab? Sure. Because, yeah. Be happy to do that anytime, guys. Please, thank you. Uh, okay. I don't know whether I'm in the right spot or not. Yeah, I am. Okay. <sighs> Okay, I'm going to pull it up. Now we're going to go this way. Sorry. I'm trying, I've got multiple ways of accessing it, and this seems to be the best way for me to do that. You said the post lab, correct? Yes. Yes. All right. Do you recall which questions? Stop that. The last two. It should be. It just. Just the last two. Why? Oh, you know why? Crap! I can't do it this way. Sorry, I can't do it that way because the window's closed. Uh, who's asking a question, Brian? Yeah. Do you mind if I display your quiz? No, it's fine. I mean, yeah, it's fine. Right, I'm doing this. Okay, Brian. I take it you want me to look at the second one rather than the first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ah, crap. <laughs> you got the you got one of them right because there was only five questions. Pardon? You got forty out of fifty points. So I got one of them right. Yeah, you did. Oh, Even a blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and again, Brian. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. You did get both of them wrong. Oh, yeah, man. All right. So. Okay. Uh, this is, I remember going through this with you guys. And I got to sit here and read it through myself because it's a little convoluted. Okay. Oh, D50. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. First thing you got to do, you got to turn 12 fluid ounces into milliliters. Okay. By multiplying it by the 29 point, um, 29.5735. Okay, that means I have 354 milliliters. Okay. 
Now I got to turn the 354 milliliters into liters by multiply by the dividing it by a thousand. This means I have 0.354882 liters. That is the volume. I have to multiply that by the concentration, which is 0 0.000040. Mm, and I came up with, oh, all right, oh, never mind, I'm an idiot. Okay, I multiply the point three five four liters times the molarity, which is point. Zero, 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 0000004 and I get 1.416 e to the fifth negative fifth moles of my Allura red which I then have to multiply by 496.42 that gives me 0 0.00702 grams which if I multiply it by a thousand gives me a close answer to theirs, to his answer of 7.05. Did you get that, Brian? I'll go through it again. All right? All right. First thing, you got 12 ounces, right? Yeah. So you multiply it to 12 ounces by 29.5735 milliliters per ounce. And that mm -hmm. gave you a number approximately 354 milliliters. You with me so far, Brian? Brian? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So I take the 354 milliliters. I have to multiply that by one liter over a thousand milliliters to get 0.354 liters. Mm -hmm. Okay. I okay. multiply the 0.354 liters by the concentration, which is 0.000040. That gives me a number about 1.42 e to the minus fifth moles. I multiply the, that number of moles by the grams per mole, and that ends up with the number 0 0.00703. And that's the number of grams. I multiply that by 1,000 milligrams per gram. This gives me an answer in milligrams of 7.03. Okay, Brian, you got that? Yeah. It, this, is, this is nothing more than a dimensional analysis problem. The other problem. Okay. Now, you got to figure out... This one, you got to figure out how, much, how many glasses you need to drink to exceed the LD50 value of... 10,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight. All right. You have 210 pounds. Okay. That when we're looking at that value of 10,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight, that's distributed, considered distributed throughout your entire body. So the first thing I have to do is I have to take 210 pounds and I have to Divide that by 2.205 because it's one kilogram per 2.205 pounds. This gives me a, a number of kilograms of 95.238 kilograms of body weight. I multiply that by 10,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. This ends up with 952,380 milligrams of Allura Red. Okay, that's what I have to exceed. I got to write that number down. All right, each glass contains 8.6 milligrams. 
Okay, so I simply divide that number by 8.6 and I end up with 110,741. Again, let me go over that. First thing, my body weight is 210 pounds. I have to change that to kilograms, so I divide that by 2.205 pounds per one kilogram. This gives me a number of 95.2 kilograms. I've got to multiply that by my LD50 of 10,000 milligrams per kilogram. That gives me a number of 952,000 milligrams of, of uh, the Allura red dye. This means this is how much I have to put in my body to exceed the LD50 value. Now, if that's the amount to exceed it, and each glass is 8.6 milligrams of dye for every glass, I multiply that 952,000 by one glass over 8.6, and this will give me 110,741 glasses. In other words, you got to drink a whole shitload of this before you're going to kill yourself. I wouldn't recommend this as a suicide gesture. You good, Brian? Yeah, I got it. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Fair enough. Uh, this should not be that involved tonight. One calculation. There's one calculation, but nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you got to know it because you're not going to only see it here. You're going to see it later. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So I'm going to get into that, which is thin layer chromatography. And unfortunately, you've got a history buff as a professor, so you got to deal with a little bit of crap. All right, you guys have all done this experiment before. How many of you have spilled some coffee, put a paper towel in it, and watched as that brown stain just kind of like flowed through the paper towel? Have you all done that? Now, if you take that paper towel and dry it out, at the very edge of that paper towel, don't you see kind of like a brown stain there? That is the same thing we're doing tonight, the same exact thing. In around 1900, a Russian scientist by the name of Mikhail Twisit, basically he used some diatonaceous earth. Diatonaceous earth is nothing more than they have purified it to the point where the earth looks white. He then took some plants he added the plants, pulverized them up, and he added some sort of a solvent to it, probably something like alcohol. And he shook this up, and he got as much of the stuff in the plants into the alcohol. Then he placed this extra extract near the bottom of the cylinder, and he immersed the cylinder into a solvent. What he got, what he got was a pattern, a pattern of dots which occurred. And basically he came to realize that each one of these spots represents a different chemical. Has anybody ever seen the DNA, DNA barcode? Anybody ever seen a DNA barcode? kind of looks something like this, only the DNA barcode is black and white, whereas this one is colored. Basically, because when he did it, he was able to extract different colors. That's how chromatography got its name, chrome meaning color. So what is it? Chromatography is a separation or a purification technique that involves putting a mixture onto a stationary media. Then what you do is you expose 
that stationary media to a mobile media. The job of the mobile phase is to move the mixture through, push it up along the stationary phase. The job of the stationary move, media is to prevent the mixture from moving. And basically what happens, the individual compounds within the mixture have unique chemical bonds. Because of this, they each have different forces which act upon them. Now, when you introduce the compound to the stationary phase, there are bonds that form between that compound and the stationary phase. When you put the mobile phase in there, the mobile phase breaks those bonds and makes bonds of, it all, of its own, and it carries it a little further along. But then the compound sees more of the stationary phase. So it attaches it again to the stationary phase. So you get this battle between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. And it's because of this battle that allows these compounds to go up at different rates. All right? Depending upon the attraction the, the compound has for the stationary phase, if it's really, really attracted to the stationary phase, it's not going to move. If it doesn't care about being in the stationary phase, then the mobile phase is going to carry it along. Ladies and gentlemen, I used to use, I used to use this analogy when I was testifying in court all the time. Think about if you have a big long hallway that's lined with Velcro, and at the same time you throw a tennis ball and a racquetball through this hallway. The tennis ball, because it's fuzzy, kind of adheres to the Velcro and goes down the hallway at a much slower rate. So that if I were going to collect these things at the end, all the racquetballs would have gone through at the same time, then all the, all the tennis balls. So I would have effectively purified one from the other. Does this kind of make sense to you? Now, different chromatographies are, are, have different stationary and mobile phases, and they are defined by the mobile and stationary phase. What we're doing today, paper chromatography or thin layer chromatography, the stationary phase is going to be a a solid. It's a solid stationary phase. The mobile phase is going to be a liquid. Now, more prevalent in science today is something called gas liquid chromatography, where basically they have these little beads and the little beads are coated with a liquid. And the coating in the liquid that's on these beads stops the chemicals from going through. At the same time, these big long tubes are filled with a very high gas pressure that's at a high temperature. The combination of the high temperature and the high pressure forces these things through. Again, by the time we get through one of these big long tubes, we've effectively purified the sample. High pressure liquid chromatography is another one you will be exposed to. Stationary phase is a solid, much like tweezit used. The mobile phase is a liquid, but that liquid is under a very high pressure. So our solid phase is a paper. The mobile phase is a chemical solvent. When you're doing this, you're gonna draw a line. You're gonna figure out 1.5 centimeters from the bottom of the piece of paper, you're gonna draw a pencil line. It's gonna be pencil because if you draw it in ink, ink has different components. Those different components uh, will separate out and confuse you. So you're going to use pencil. You're gonna put all of your knowns onto the paper at this 1.5 margin. 
but you're gonna make them one centimeter apart so they don't contaminate one, of, one another. You're gonna put all your known materials and your unknown mixtures onto this paper. You're gonna put the paper then, you're gonna put it into a cylinder and you're gonna put this into a chamber that has the liquid mobile phase in it. The liquid is gonna draw up the paper. It's gonna draw up the paper until you get very close to the top. Then you are going to make a mark. You're gonna take the paper out of the chamber you're going to take the tape away and you're going to draw, make it flat and you're going to draw a pencil line where the solvent has eluded. Then you are going to calculate what is known as the RF for each one of the knowns and the different values of your unknown. RF stands for retardation factor. And this is the one and only calculation you need to do for this laboratory. The RF is equal to the distance that the spot moved, measured from where the spot center is. You take that distance, you divide it by the distance the solvent moved. So if I have my three samples here, I have my solvent front. That is gonna be the distance from my origin where I started out to where the solvent moved. Now, if I was gonna get the RF of, of the red one, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start from the origin and I'm gonna measure it to about halfway where the spot is. From the origin to where the center of the spot is, is my B distance. I'm then gonna take that and divide it by the distance that the solvent moved. Is this making sense, guys? So if the distance to the center of my spot is 1.19 inches, and the distance to solve a travel is 1.75 in inches, I divide the 1.19 by the 1.75. That gives me an RF of 0 0.680. There are no units since the inches cancel. Now, it was originally thought that we could just take a bank of these RFs. If we know what the solvent is, we know the media it's on, then no problem. We'll just take and we'll make, we'll run all these known materials and we're gonna store them in a data table with the RF for that particular solvent. Unfortunately, there are too many variables that affect RF values. If we mess up the solvent concentration a bit, temperature, temperature of the thing. You know, if you're, if you're at a higher temperature, it dissolves more. The RF will move up faster. Pressure is going to affect it. The paper quality, paper thickness. All of these affect the RF. So basically what we do now is we spot known materials along with our unknowns. Then we compare however far our known travels, if that meets up with a spot in our unknown, then we know we have that particular unknown within our set of unknowns. Any questions about that, guys? No. You're just happy to get out of here, aren't you? <laughs> I think I'm we're doing a my best. Surprised. I'm only a half an hour in. I'm sorry, what? I think we're surprised. I feel like, you know, that's it. That's it. Yeah, it looks very short and not as stressful. It's, it's very, very short, and I think it's very understandable. Yeah. I seriously used to go on the stand and use that same analogy. Okay, we're going to get into TLCs. Now,
All right, the report. Um, Professor, I forgot to tell you at the beginning, but I remember I told you about the, the, the slope, that it was different. I think I was doing something wrong, so I think I fixed it. I'm not 100% sure if it's the right number. Did but... you get a real big number for the slope, Veronica? I got a, you told me that it was 2315, I got 2320. That's fine. Perfect. You did good. Okay. Okay. Results. All right. Now, when you go to put these on the, when you go to put these onto the paper, Generally speaking, you're going to find that they have their colored solutions. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the color of the spot before you stain it. And you're going to answer the first four questions as to what color it is. Believe me, trust me, Dr. Musgrave is color challenged. Do the best you can here, okay? So you got five compounds. You have to answer what color it is before staining each and every time, okay? Then you're going to apply a stain to this so that you can visualize all of the ions. And you're gonna to have to determine what the color is after these things have been stained, okay? Now, you're going to have five known materials. All you're doing on this text box is listing the chemical ion and it's RF. There are five of them. I want you to see five. I'll give you one straight up. Silver is not gonna move off the origin, so it's RF is gonna be approximately zero. Which explains why I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to have you do 12. You're going to have to show me how one RF is calculated. Now, I do not want you to use silver. Do not use silver for this answer. Now, You have your five samples. You, remember I told you silver doesn't move? You got cobalt, copper, iron, and bismuth. But you've also spotted your unknown. Don't answer this, but think to yourself, do I have something that this is matching with? If I have something that that is matching with, not only in terms of how far it goes up the plate, but what color it turned with the stain. Then you are going to look and answer the question as to what your unknowns are. Questions about the results section. Okay. Post lab. It's like you guys got the week off. I wish. <laughs> Come on, how hard was that first thing? Well, that is true. It, it is easy. Okay. Point of application, the origin. What you did was you put this in the solvent and you allowed it to go in this direction. That's how far the solvent moved. You are need to figure out what the RF of substance three is. That spot, figure out, do the measurement from here to the center, from here to where the solvent moved. 
Tell me what the RF of that is. Same thing. For here, you're going to figure out what the RF of substance four is. Okay. Uh. You don't know why, but that's the answer, guys. I'll give you 10 points. That's the answer. Basically what happens is time increases, the solvent dissipates the, dissipates the uh, spot, makes the spot bigger. Dimensional analysis problem. And that's it. Questions, guys? I do want to look at one thing before I back at the results section. Okay. It's something that's I just want to look at it just to make sure that I'm that you guys aren't going to get tricked up by something. And that is this question. Notice, do you remember something? Do you remember when I showed you this before? Remember before, it kind of matched the pink one and the gray one? Now I've got a different result. It's going to change on you. Okay. I'm just looking to make sure that, all right, make sure when you're answering this question, you're using the slide that's presented before you, okay? Okay. <clears throat> all right, when you're doing question 11 and 12, and when you're answering all the color questions, what I want you to do is I want you to, crap, I'm, I'm trapped. You're gonna go to the student uh, data for labs to answer the color questions and to get the information for the RFs. Are we clear on that, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. And that means I'm going to be out of here like in momentarily. Course content. And student data for labs. I'm going to go up here. And you're going to go all the way down to TLC. All right, he gives you the colors before staining, the colors after staining. How hard is that gonna be, guys? Match up the colors to the ions, okay? 
He gives you the distance to solvent moved, the distance the cation moved for each one of the known materials. So you're going to have to calculate all five RFs, put it in that one question, and you're going to have to show me how you calculated one in another question. Note, I do not want you using AG. Use any of the other fours. I don't care which of the other fours you use. Just do not use AG. Any questions, guys? Um, not from the lab, but when are we doing the final? Do we have any final for the lab? Yes, we do. Guys, I'm done. If you need to go, please feel free. Is Veronica, do yes. you realize you are seriously taking me away from my glass of Pinot Grigio? Uh, I'm sorry. And you don't have any guilt, do you? Um, does this, Kara, does I, it sound like she has guilt? <laughs> Belle, Belle, does it sound like she has guilt, Brian? I no. just said <laughs> She's on a quest for knowledge. <laughs> ah, yes. Aren't we all? Okay, experiment schedule. That should do it for me. We don't have that many labs left, guys. All right, think about how hard this lab is. This is a gimme lab. Okay, heat of vaporization, another gimme lab. It's not that hard. Vesper, you're going to have to work at it. But Vesper, I don't think is that hard. Guys, we only have two more labs. Then, uh, the 27th of April, Veronica, this is the week before your regular finals. That is when your lab final is. Okay, Veronica? Okay, how uh, is it going to be? How is it going to be? I don't... Like, are you gonna put all the labs together? How, how? Basically, you're going to be asked questions that pertain to the labs. And for example, if I was doing, if I was designing a question for the standardization of a base and the uh, percent mass of the antacid. Sorry, my internet went down. Um, if I was going to design a question mm -hmm. for the standardization of a base and the uh, uh, mass percent of the antacid, what I would do is I would give you the standardization of a base. I would give you the molarity and the volume of the HCl. I'm sorry, excuse me, backtrack. Let me... Let me erase that. I would give you the grams of the uh, potassium hydrogen phosphate, the KHP. I would give you the grams of that. And I would tell you how many milliliters of NaOH you used and how many milliliters of a certain molarity of HCl you used to back titrate. Given that information, you should be able to discern the molarity of your NaOH. Okay. Then you have in this particular experiment, what you did was you added excess HCl. You added more HCl than it took to titrate your N acid, your bicarbonate in your antacid. So you weighed your antacid tablet. You put all of that antacid in the HCl. There's excess HCl there. You titrate that with NaOH that you know the concentration of. You also know that the concentration of the base times the volume of the base are going to be equal to the I'm sorry, the concentration of the base times the volume of the base are going to be equal to the concentration of the acid times the molarity of the acid. 
let me, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting confused here right now myself. Concentration of the acid times the volume of the acid are going to be equal to concentration of the base times the volume of the base plus the amount that the antacid neutralized. Okay. You subtract moles of HCl and moles of NaOH. This gives you the moles of HCl that were used to neutralize the base. You then have to use the stoichiometry to get the moles of the antacid. That you then multiply by the molecular weight of the antacid to get the grams of antacid. You divide that by the weight of the tablet, you're done. Okay, okay. Veronica? Okay. That's something similar. Now, I don't know whether or not somewhere in here they've given you a means of review. I'm hoping so. Final review. How about that? How nice. Go down this thing right after student data for labs. Click on the final review. And what, it's, what it is, is it's going to give you problems with answers, I believe. Maybe yes, maybe no. I guess that's all they're giving you. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's all they're giving you. So basically the lab will be um, more than 10 questions, the lab find? Uh, I would say somewhere between 10 and 15. Okay. I'll get more answers. I'll look at the lab. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, Veronica. Uh, I'll, I'll look at it before, definitely before the Vesper lab, probably the best thing. If somebody emails me, then I can, I promise to look at it before the next week. If somebody emails me and then I'll be able to answer that better. Okay. Okay. The Sounds best good. way, the best way to prepare for the final is to redo all the calculations you've done all semester. Okay. Uh, the other thing I had, there's something else. Oh, yeah. The other thing is you're allowed to use your notebooks on the final. Oh, okay. Good. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Nope. You, you just want to get me to that glass of Pinot Grigio, don't you? <laughs> Now, yes. Now you should go. <laughs> okay, guys, that's all I have for you. All right. I will see good you night. again next. Have a good night. I will see you again next week. All right. Bye-bye.